full value chain to in, uh, invest uh, there everywhere, plus financialization, <coughs> stock markets, uh, speculation. All this becomes part of that, making money, as money and making money, and this kind of situation. And what were the effects of neoliberal capitalist globalization, obviously? One, mass poverty continues. Second, the most incredible increases in the inequalities of income and wealth. Incredible increases. Nothing like it. At the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, maybe the differences would be maybe 10 to 1 or something. Now it's 70, 80 to 1 between the top 10% and the bottom 10% or whatever. Huge inequalities. I mean, come on And this actually creates anger and frustration in a way that even poverty doesn't. In the sense that when you have both of these together, when people see that so many people are benefiting and others are not, it arouses a great deal of anger and frustration. And of course, when you have great inequalities of economic power, it also means that you're screwing up whatever levels of democracy there are. So a second factor is that you find everywhere the, uh, a certain kind of development in democracy, an erosion of the content of democracy. If you like, you have two things. After the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, uh, Anna, the communist bloc, uh, you had in some cases an expansion of proceduralist democracies to certain countries, sub-Saharan Africa. Hmm? You now have some kind of an ele electoral system, some minimal rights are there. But everywhere where there were existing liberal democratic setups, they've all become much, much weaker. They've all become much more eroded. So that too is a second factor that you have there which is important. A third factor is even as all of these problems are taking place, and especially after the collapse of the communist bloc, there is also, if you like, a kind of ideological disarray. Ideology in the sense of a set of beliefs, if you like. Huh? The declining belief in the possibility of an alternative to what is existing. That also. All of these things add up to frustration. And the fourth factor that you have to take into consideration is what you can call a kind of psychic disorientation. Hmm? I said the politics of cultural experience. Let me just explain psychic disorientation. How does this come from? What did globalization mean? What globalization meant, if you like, is that a lived experience of a person, of an ordinary person, wherever they are in the world. Hmm? Because it's now the factors that shape a person's lives are now so much more complex and they operate at a global scale. So if you like, the time space coordinates of a lived experience cannot any longer even help you to understand what are the forces that are shaping your own life. There's a problem for you here, huh? This is that. All of these things are happening. So this too creates a kind of psychic disorientation. And what just happens when this kind of happens? What happens is that people then, not surprisingly, try to cling on to those identities that seem permanent and unchanging. Hmm? Actually, modern life is one in which we all have multiple identities. Hmm? But the rise of identity politics in both positive and negative ways. Huh? But let me first, before I come to this last point here, and elaborate a bit on that, I said the politics of cultural exclusivism everywhere. Hmm? We, nowadays, we talk about the North and the South, right? Before, it used to be, before 19, uh, 1990, the talk used to be about the three worlds. The first world, the second world, and the third world, right? The first world, advanced countries, capitalist countries. Second world, the so-called non-capitalist, socialist bloc, or whatever you want to call it. And the third world, right? Everywhere, from the early 80s onwards, what do you find? You find the politics of cultural exclusivism, which has four forms. Race, ethnicity, religion, nation, either separately or in combination. Usually when in combination, in combination with the nation. So take the first world. Yeah. What did you begin to have? You begin to have 
in Western Europe, the politics of anti-immigrant uh, racism and anti-immigrant xenophobia. What did you have in the second one after the uh, 1990? Nationalist irredentisms. Everywhere. Breakup of the Soviet Union. Fights between Pula, Georgia and, and Russia. Here, there, everywhere, right? All sorts of things, yeah. Balkans, Serbia, right? all that fights. Nationalist irredentisms, right? What did you have in the third world? And not just in the third world, but everywhere? The politics of cultural exclusion related to religious extremists of various kinds. Hmm? We're talking about the rise of Islamic extremist cultural extremism. We're talking about the rise of Hindu. Huh? We're talking about the rise of Christian evangelism, right-wing Christian even uh, evangelical currents of various kinds here. Uh, we're talking about Buddhism, Buddhist evangelism. Buddhist, the most peaceful of all religions, the great contribution of India. And what do you have? You have brutality in Myanmar. You know they have a law in Myanmar that says that Muslims can only have, not just for Hindus, but all Muslims in Myanmar can only have a certain limited number of children. Hmm? In Myanmar. Myanmar? Sri Lanka? Any other country? Think of another uh, Buddhist religious country? Rise of Buddhist religion? Thailand. Right? So everywhere you're having these kinds of developments that are taking place um, uh, uh, globally here. So why? And I try to suggest that this is the reason here. And when I mention thing about psychic disorder, orientation, this kind of flux that's happening, and you're trying to cope with it. What are identities? Identities are filters through which you sort of look and try to understand the world. Now we live in a world of multiple identities. And coping in modernity is to recognize that Different identities are the filters that you look at the world, but they change from time to time. There's always a real danger. Class is different. The reason that the class is different from identities is that you can't talk about people having a strong identity unless subjectively they feel that identity. Hmm? I'm black. I'm white. I'm Muslim. I'm Hindu. I'm Buddhist. Huh? Uh, uh, or uh, some, I'm this ethnic group. Huh? Class, you can belong to a class without thinking it belongs to a class. It's much more an objective thing. And it's much more difficult to raise a subjective consciousness of class in the same way that it's easier to uh, raise a subjective oh, and then, but this thing. And so people tend to cling, cling to those that seem permanent and unchangeable identities, which are usually those that are ascribed at birth. Yeah. Most people are, uh, are are religious because they happen to be born in that particular religion. No matter how much you talk about conversion from any religion, this stuff for them, it's usually a very small proportion in relation to those that are here. But my point is there, you try to cling on to that. Ideology is important because having a set of beliefs gives you confidence, gives you is a way for you to cope and hope. Okay, things are bad now. But things will get better if you're wrong. Because I believe in this and look at this. So all of these points are there. Okay. So you have these four factors that help to explain. That's what I meant when I wrote here, but I don't think it's a point. It's not, I don't think you can see this here. But now let's come to this particular point, which is very important. That you have a transnational phenomenon of neoliberal capitalist globalization. This, as I pointed out, is the most right-wing, miserly form of capitalist development. <coughs> because of the enormous inequalities that you have faced. I don't know if you've heard this, but there's something very interesting I should tell you about India before you were heard. You all heard of Thomas Piketty and Sais. They did some work which you don't find, I don't know why people don't bring it out here. You know that in India, from 19, uh, uh, 1950 mm -hmm. to 1980, when you had a low rate of growth in India, on average, what used to be dismissed as the Hindu rate of growth or whatever, when you had a low rate of growth, the annual increase in the income, the average annual increase over those last 
from 1950 to 1980. The average annual increase in income of the bottom 50% of the population in India is higher than the period from 1980 to 2015, where the average annual income of the bottom 50% in their terms is actually lower. What does that mean? It means that after 1980, you have higher growth rates on average in India. So overall, there is an accumulation of income so that many poor people have gone above the poverty line and so on. But actually, when the income uh, annual, uh, annual growth rate was lower, the bottom 50% benefited more. But please notice what the discussion around the budget and everything is all about. Oh, it's a very simple thing for journalists, for everybody. Oh, the growth is high, the growth is high. And obviously, the reason for that is the enormous increase in inequalities. The biggest beneficiaries have been those at the top. Huh? And you're always telling you all boats are being lifted. You are also getting better. Look, yours is better than before. But this is an interesting statistic to keep in mind. Huh? Anyway, so transnational capitalist globalization is a right wing form of capitalist development as compared to earlier commitments to Keynesianism, to what was called social democracy, to the welfare state, to development in the third world, and so on. But this right wing shift in capitalism cannot be stabilized. How is it to be stabilized? Let me put it to you this way. There are three characteristics of capitalism. One, related to its dynamism, its strength and weakness, the question of competition. Second, coordination. Coordination is generally provided by the market, but the market doesn't always coordinate well. The third, and the most important, is not intrinsic to capitalism. Competition is intrinsic to capitalism. The third, which is not intrinsic, is in fact stabilization. What is it that stabilizes capitalist development? And the answer is very interesting. Government interventions. Huh? Sorry? Government interventions. Sorry? Government interventions. Government, yeah. Let me put it more generally. It's connected to what I said earlier. You could not have a stabilized, you have a world in which you have a neoliberal capitalist globalization, a transnationalized process of capitalist development, but it's operating in a world of multiple nation states. Hmm? Remember, maybe 10, 15 years ago in sociology or in, in other political science, one question at the exam time. Huh? In the era of globalization, has the nation, uh, has the nation suffered a decline? Question mark. Huh? Three possible answers. Huh? Yes, the nation state has declined. Huh? Second possible answer, no. The power of the nation state is roughly the same, but it's changed. Less in economics, more in social matters. Third answer, actually, the nation state's power and importance has increased in the time of uh, globalization. One very interesting thing has developed and has taken place. Since the late 1970s and early 80s, what you've actually had is an increase in the number of nation states. And according to some people, through this transnationalization of capitalism, you have the emergence of a transnational capitalist class. Is that correct? The other view is no. You haven't. In fact, what we call multinational corporations should actually be called transnational corporations. Why? Because multinational suggests that their ownership and control is multinational. When actually, it's not the case. You have Chinese transnational corporations, some Indian transnational corporations, British transnational corporations, Dutch transnational corporations, and others. And in fact, the relationship between the state and these capitalist classes like Trump. Because in competition, you don't just have winners, you also have losers among capitalists. And when they lose, they don't simply say, ah, oh, we believe in capitalism, we believe in the market. And when we are losing, then we have lost our market, uh, must, be, uh, must be respected. They don't respect the market. They want protection. And who do they look to for protection? To the states. 
So what's my point? My point here is that when you talk about uh, neoliberal capitalist globalization as a right-wing shift in economics, it can only be stabilized through a right-wing shift in politics and ideology, which is always or invariably nationally and regionally specific. So different parts of the world which have undergone this shift towards neoliberal capitalist globalization, it gets stabilized in ways which are very specific to the histories of those particular countries. So that even though neoliberal capitalist globalization should be understood as the direction. <coughs> and because different countries have started at a different level in that direction, and different countries have a different sequence and speed with which they move towards this thing, yet you will find variations. For example, the United States of America is the wealthiest country in the world. But it has a much weaker welfare state, even under Keynesian, in the Keynesian era, than Western Europe. Any of you know the reason why? The basic reason why this is the case? Why is it that the wealthiest country in the world, the United States, has a much weaker welfare state than France, Germany, Sweden, Britain, even? Even though those, as a result of neoliberal capitalist globalization, their welfare state is also getting eroded and weakened. But they're still much better. That's what I meant by being a direction in which they're moving, but different people in different sequences here. India is a disaster. You don't even have a welfare state of any kind. But all the time, right? Why? Why the United States is weakest than compared to any other country? The answer is very simple. It has the weakest working class movement. It has the weakest, it has two uh, political parties which are very uh, bourgeois parties. In Western Europe, elsewhere, you have a Labour Party in the United States, you have a Communist Party, a Socialist Party. They have now become much less communist sources, moved to the right. But that history is one of the most important reasons why you have this history. But anyway, so you have this um, stabilized. So if you want to understand the rise of the right wing in any country, you can't just say, oh, neoliberal capitalist globalization. You have to address the realities in those particular countries. Again, the crucial question of nationalism has come up with that, right? Authoritarianism and right-wing populism. We use these two terms, authoritarianism and right-wing populism. What's the difference between the two? Very simple. Authoritarianism is a form of governance. <laughs> populism is a style of politics. Okay. Authoritarianism and populism. You can have authoritarian populism and you can have authoritarianism which is not populist. Military dictatorships, authoritarianism. Okay? Right? So authoritarianism, right wing populism, not the same thing. Hmm? You can have an authoritarian populism from above. First authoritarianism and then trying to promote it. More dangerous is if you have an authoritarian populism from below, which is able to come to power and establish. Okay? So these are important differences here. But one thing notice, whenever you talk about political currents that are authoritarian or political uh, uh, I mean uh, currents that are authoritarian or right wing populism, authoritarian populism. Please notice one thing. Everywhere, they are authoritarian nationalisms. Right? Everywhere. Depend. Right? Talks about authoritarian nationalism. Right? So a question comes up. Why nationalism? Hmm? Hmm? By the way, before I take up this question, why nationalism? I mentioned earlier that I said that I believe that the nation state has become more important in this period, and this is very important to understand because the nation state is, remains, it retains its importance even in the framework of neoliberal capitalist globalization for its economic functions, for its political functions, for its social functions, and so on. Even its economic functions are very, very important. Huh? We are going to remain a world of multiple currencies. Therefore, Individual countries, RBI, very much the same. You have floating exchange rate system. The government has to come in from time to time. You have crises of capitalism. 
and not listen. Who is going to help you out in that state? You have a state which has to arbitrate between different capitalists. So even economically, hmm, it has to resort to it. It has to talk in terms of, okay, sometimes. So Obama has to bail out and then spend. If there are pressure movements from below which put demands on it, then they will have to concede those demands, accept it. The farmers struggle over here. They're conceded, but you please notice they're not doing anything about fulfilling the demands of the farmers' struggle. They have repealed the law, but they haven't done that. Yeah. And this budget doesn't do anything either. Okay. So it remains there. Politically, very, very important, and that is that in competition, in all this unequalness of inequalities and so on, you will always have do and losers. What is the job of the state? To make control and police the losers. To fend off movements. Hmm? To protect the ruling classes. All of that. So politically, economically, socially, it's very, very important for to have the state here. But why the power uh, of uh, nationalism? It is more powerful than religion. People are prepared to die for religion and people are prepared to die for the nation. And people who are not religious are prepared to die for the religion. For the nation, right? Why is it that nationalism is more powerful than religion? And if you don't believe me, Look at those forces which talk about the Islamic caliphate, caliphate to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, bring about a larger caliphate. They will fail. And you find that throughout the world where there are Islamic extremist currents, they are connected to nationalism much more. The two majority Shia countries, two countries have a, uh, a majority Shia population. They had the second longest war of the 20th century. You know those two countries? Iraq and Iraq. You may have any number of tribes in Afghanistan that are Islamists, huh? but they are even fighting each other on tribal lines. Huh? Islamic nationalism. Akhar Bharat, Hindu huh? <coughs> Nepal is a Hindu majority country. If some RSS person tells Nepalis, Nepalis, you are Hindu like us. Give up your Nepali partners and join us in creating a big kind of Bharat. You know what the Nepali will say? I'm a Hindu, I'm proud of Hindu, but you, Mr. India, big brother, you don't talk about us giving up Nepaliness. So now the other oh, we need it only culturally. Right? Why? What is the power? that nationalism has, that they have to co-opt it if they really want to be powerful, rather than go be it. And to try to make it a failure, right? What's the problem? Anybody want to suggest? Have you all read Ben Anderson's Imagined Communities? Yes. Then you should know the answer, because he puts it very well. He says these other communities like religion are imagined communities. Imagined meaning they're not face-to-face -face communities. You know, you have to imagine a horizontal connection to all of it, right? But nationalism is an imagined political community. There is a political dimension to nationalism that gives it a power that even the religious identity cannot have. It tries to politicize itself, and to politicize itself, it has to move in the direction of nationalism. And there are two aspects of this power. The modern nation state, and the nation state is modern. Nationalism is modern. Hmm? That doesn't mean that countries don't try to invent a past for themselves. They all do, except those which are immigrant countries like Australia or the United States. They generally, oh yes, this is something. The nation state is a modern state which is different from pre modern states which were not nation states. There were states, obviously, the patrimony of the king, ruler. Therefore, you have to see how great they are and all that. Stuff, huh? But they were not nation states. What is the nation state? Huh? It's the distinction between being subjects of an older state to now becoming citizens of the nation state. From Praja to Nagar. Hmm? And becoming citizens 
means that there is now a vertical connection to the state, which is profoundly different from that the past. That state is supposed to belong to you, the people of that state. And the world is divided, the people of the world are divided into different nation states. <coughs> this is it. It is for you. So that even a dictatorship, like in Pakistan, Mashar says, I'm not doing this to my family. My family is not a royalist. I'm doing it for the people of Pakistan. Whatever I do. We have to take over the coup. We have to do it for the people. Whatever. <coughs> and the second one is that you're all citizens equal. A horizontal connection. In other words, even though, even and of course if it's a liberal democracy, that legitimacy is greater. And even though in a liberal democracy, the people do not rule the state. Huh? They don't rule it. They are, are the legitimizers of those who rule. That's all. Hmm? And they of course do whatever they want and all. But, they, but yet this is a very powerful, empowering aspect. So you see the importance of the nationalism in the nation state. That doesn't mean we can't go beyond it. But that we, we have, don't have to go beyond it. We have to because so many problems are international. But I think this is very important to understand the power of nationalism. Why you have this situation here. In the Indian context, it's obvious, isn't it? They have to cover up the fact, uh, the uh, Sangh Parivar have to cover up the fact that they were not, never part of the uh, national movement in any way. Vajpayee once attended a, uh, uh, a, a, a meeting and he was uh, arrested and then left and he said, Nani Kwa Yom Saan He said, he had to be left off. Why do this that they want to co-opt Siddhar Patel, Gujarati, on the right wing of the Congress, huh? but that way they can try to connect to the uh, national movement. Huh? They try to co-opt uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Hmm? They even try to co-opt Bhagat uh, 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 Singh, right? who was a Marxist and an atheist. Huh? They have to try to get across that. We were also there. But you can see. Uh, so, here. Yeah. Okay. The power of nationalism, that also implies that we also have to fight on the level of nationalism as well as go beyond that level. Because one thing you should remember about nationalism, there are limits to how progressive nationalism can be. There are no limits to how reactionary it can be. And we all have identity which enable us to also identify and connect with people outside of ourselves. You can be white and you can be for the struggle of black people. You can be male and you can be in the struggle of other genders. You can be Indian and yet be committed to the Palestinian struggle. It's part of our larger humanity. It's part of the fact that there is a universal humanism as contrasted to that. And we can. And that's why you sometimes have the slogan of people here, yeah, not in my name when the government does something. Because all governments everywhere want to say that we represent our people. Except those who are not clean nationalists. But anyway, leave that aside. So my third point here, let me come, is populism and popular power. I said populism is a style of politics. Don't confuse it with popular power. Not all populisms are rooted, or have grassroots organization or power. Hmm? Even those which are populism from below, need not have strong grassroots structures. Examples, Le Pen's in France. Hmm? A counter example, the strongest counter example is in fact the Sangh Pariwa. So this rootedness elsewhere. So there's no straightforward connection between popular power and populism. Hmm? Trump, populism. Huh? Others can also make populism of various <coughs> There has also been what's called the greater personalization of politics. 50, 60 years ago, huh, the medium of public political conversation used to be the meeting. <coughs> hmm? That used to be the past meeting you had. Huh? And you go here. Yeah. Huh? People used to be emphasizing the question of our program and look how different it is from other people's programs. Yeah. Huh? People used to read leaflets and all that here. Yeah. Now what has happened is there is much greater personalization of the media, uh, of, of politics. The personality becomes much more important. Huh? Whether it's Trump or Bolsonaro or Modi or whatever. Huh? 
What are the factors that have helped this? One, neoliberal capitalist globalization has meant that there is policy convergences and programmatic convergences of the major parties. Hmm? So, you have some differences between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, not on economics so much, but Clinton's party is not Democrat, will be more of a social liberal party, social liberalism. Hmm? Now, we are very much concerned about uh, patriarchy and oppression of feminism. We are very much concerned about racism, this, that, that. But when it comes to economics or when it comes to foreign policy and all, huh? are there any differences, right? So, you have uh, policy conversion. In India, <coughs> not only has the left itself shifted right, the mainstream left and other left shifted right, but the other parties. Uh, what are differences on Hindutva? Yes, but soft in the Neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has two forms. What's called compensatory neoliberalism and disciplinary neoliberalism. Compensatory neoliberalism, certain soft, soft things, Yedia, Wodia, Navarti, huh? okay, this we do, that we do, yeah, depending upon that. And there'll be variation depending on the context. But it's basically neoliberal. Probably, huh? But you have this variation there. No? So, policy conversion. Second is that the medium of public conversation has become the television and then in my, gen uh, in my generation and now the social media. Hmm? What does that mean? It means either that on television how you come across becomes more important than, uh, than what you stand for in terms of a party's program and all that. There is an encapsulation of news. There's an encapsulation of understanding. People read less and less. And reading is something which of course forces you to actually think about things in a way which just that. And social media, social media, even the Twitter, this, that, whatever. What? Capsulization of all that. What all this does, think, reinforces something that's already happening because of neoliberal capitalist globalization, which is social atomization. Everything is an economy of time. There are only 24 hours in the day, right? Hmm? I suppose that everybody sleeps for eight hours a day. Huh? Yeah. Eats this thing here, whatever, right? You have to go to classes. Huh? And I don't know if you're allowed to take your smartphone into classes here. You are in Delhi University. Nobody's bothering about what the teacher is saying. <laughs> it's a reality, huh? disastrous situation. Yeah. But the point is that how many people spend how much time on the, on your mobile or your laptop or your uh, desktop and all that? Yeah. Everything is an economy of time. Huh? So you have a reinforcement in a certain sense of social atomization. Huh? Now, the social media is very good at generating an awareness for punctual events. So through the social media, the positive aspect is that people can come together very, very dramatically for a certain point of time, and they can have something like Ali Square, or you can have this kind of exposure. But it is not a substitute for grassroots, long-term, face-to-face interaction and mobilization, because that is how you build mass loyalties. You build mass loyalties by not just connecting to people, but working with people, not just on cultural and other issues, etc., but on their day-to-day -day material needs and all. And you build loyalties. Whether it was the right or whether it was the left, they build mass loyalties, not just because of the ideology that is accepted by them, yes, this is okay here, but by what they did in practice in helping ordinary people to resolve their basic problems of life, getting them a job, taking care of their daughter when it's ill, getting a doctor, helping them, these things here, helping them this. This is what actually helps and builds loyalties also. And yes, the ideological aspect, the cultural aspect here, but that aspect, and there's no real substitute even for that. So we have these explosions as a result of social media after the year. But the overall trend has been one in which you have right-wing populism, authoritarianism growing. In one part of the world, you had left-wing populisms. 
Latin America. Hmm? Uh, but they have been much fewer worldwide, much less frequent, and, uh, and much more frequent, of course, right wing populisms on the other side of Africa. So you have your strengths and weaknesses of social media. The difference between right and left populism. Similarity, they are both say that they are anti elite. But the difference is that right wing populism always have to scapegoat an enemy who is weak or vulnerable. Hmm? They have to scapegoat. They have to say, no, these are not the true nationals. Immigrants taking our jobs. Please understand that in a capitalist society, you are going to have variations in what is called the reserve army of labor. Unemployment, underemployment, miserable jobs, uncertain jobs, insecure jobs, terrible working conditions, all that. But you've got a job. Hmm? It's in the interest of people who have some kind of a job to reduce the competition from that kind of job. I said, ah, oh, but these people shouldn't be here. Huh? They are not the true nationals. They are uh, having problems for us. So you can see where the appeal of scapegoating is not merely cultural, but also rooted in material realities of various kinds. Hmm? Whether it's in Assam or whether it's uh, anywhere else. Uh, anyway, this kind of thing. So the true national business comes in, scapegoating. So right wing populism has to scapegoat. Hmm? Left wing populism is much more focused on questions of social justice and on the economy. And the difference between the two is that right wing populism benefits from pointing out the terrible effects of neoliberalism, but is not going to alter the structures of neoliberalism. The left at least says and tries to some extent to alter the structures of neoliberalism. And it doesn't scapegoat, you already weak in one, it talks about the ruling classes. Class, yeah? And of course, class is not some uh, a term that you're now supposed to take that seriously. It's just one identity among others. If you listen to a lot of post-colonialists uh, or whatever, why do you make such a big thing about that? We can take that issue up separately. So you have, of course, this also is, I think, a very, very uh, important uh, aspect over here. So the different, the ruling classes will prefer the far right to the far left or the left. The far right and the far left in liberal democratic societies, societies where there's some both have to, if they're going to electorally increase their votes and electorally become stronger, it's what they do outside the electoral arena that is very important. It's the movements that they are engaged in that helps them. In India, the single biggest movement after the national movement was the Ram Jan movement. And it was a movement that in terms of its continuity, was even longer than any single movement during the national movement. And it transformed uh, the circumstances there. So both left, even the mainstream left, left over the far left, and the right, the far right, uh, have to rely on mass movements to help them come into uh, more influential economic, uh, electorally. But once the far right comes into power electorally, it can retain its influence and get support from the ruling classes in a way that the left, uh, even the mainstream left, left, left alone the far left, cannot get. They have to keep on trying to fight at the extra electoral level to keep on fighting in order to be able to influence themselves. So there's a difference. Because the right-wing populism, right-wing authoritarianism will not challenge. Uh, they complain about the effects on that they won't challenge. Look at the Sam Parivar. You know that in its early period, because it was nationalism, Hindu nationalism, its Hindu nationalism was an economic nationalism. The shift toward neoliberalism didn't take place because the Sam took place, of course, by the Congress. Huh? But now, whether it's Vajpayee or whether it's the Bodhi regime, they have absolutely no problem in jettisoning that old economic nationalism. Huh? 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 They know where they are. In fact, they now recognize that they have to connect to them in so many ways hmm? because of the various uh, importance of capital for them in various ways. So you see that. The left at least is committed to saying that we have to change that situation. Okay. 
let me take the difference between your advanced democracies and this weakening liberal democracy of India. Many people say it's not a democracy, it's an actual democracy or whatever you like. It's greatly getting eroded. But it's still something uh, which is uh, not to be completely dismissed. Something that's important. But the difference between the advanced democracies and liberal democracy and India is that their secularity and their democracy in the advanced countries is still stronger than that in India and other countries. No matter how much criticism you make about the United States, all justified in paying this country the worst, in paying this power, and so on. Domestically, it has more of a secularity in its state, and it has democratic structures that are more stronger and more stable than in the case of India and such. You can have your Christian evangelical movement they can't overturn the basically secular state of the United States. What they can do is influence certain policies on abortion. This, that, can they say. But that's different. And look how Trump is being treated. It's still different. The same thing applies to Western Europe. Huh? Yes, everything is shifted to the right. Hmm? New liberal uh, organization takes place. Yes, because of the erosion of the welfare state, the democracy is basically weakened. Yes, there are brutalities that is taking place. But you can have one black person killed, and you can see the uproar that takes place in the United States. Does anybody uh, uh, care here? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. What is the difference in there? So it's obvious that that's still the case to keep in mind about the differences there. You have now a growing global Islamophobia. And this Islamophobia has been generated particularly after 9-11. 9-11. In fact, when uh, September 11 took place, uh, I was on a plane which was supposed to land in Washington. And uh, Washington was also bombed. And suddenly we got a call. We were about two hours from landing. We suddenly got a call that the plane is being diverted to Montreal. Hmm? And then half an hour later we were told that we didn't resolve on this. Yeah. And then when we went to Montreal and went to a hotel, I phoned my wife who was a journalist. And uh, she was, I said, what is the reaction? She said, all the journalists are so happy. I said, why? I said, oh, they're not happy because of what's happened in the US. But they said, oh, now in the, uh, the US will listen to India and we'll fix Pakistan. <laughs> That's the narrative. Then about an hour later, I phoned. And I said, what's the situation? She said, all the journalists now in the papers in here are unhappy. I said, why? <laughs> He said, because uh, the Pakistan uh, High Commissioner of the Pakistan has said that they will give all support to the United States in fighting against the terrorists. <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, beside the point. Then, uh, 24 hours, Canada and uh, border was closed in the US and now I'm there to get in this. But anyway, um, Islamophobia. Why Islamophobia? Because it's much more flexible up and down. Uh, it's different. It's there related to their imperial ambitions. It's related to the fact that if you really want to dominate the world like the US and its Western allies want to do, you have to dominate Eurasia in particular and the northern part of Africa around the Mediterranean. That might as important, Sub Saharan Africa is uh, important. So this is really where you have the biggest emerging powers, the biggest, the most resources, the most population, the most <coughs> industrialized part of the world, and so on. And in order for you to control that, you also have to control the center of Eurasia, <coughs> which is <coughs> the Middle East, or West Asia, North Africa, and Central Asia. <coughs> you have to control all that. And this is a Muslim majority area. <coughs> it's an area. <laughs> in which you have authoritarian regimes that will remain authoritarian for a very long time, undemocratic regimes. And there is a gap between the general public, which is pro-Palestinian, which is hostile to the United States, which is against their dictatorships, and those governments. And so the governments are divided by the American government and say, these are good governments because they're supporting us. So talk, they will talk about the good Muslims and the bad Muslims. <coughs> but you have also <coughs> possibly get up some water. Sure. Oh, sorry. <coughs> this is 
the part of the world that has always been most resistant to Western dominance. Historically, because it was the Ottoman Empire, which was not colonized. Much of the Buddhist world and the Hindu world and all this colonized, as well as Africa. But because the Ottoman Empire decayed, became sick person, you had, in fact, the um, a man system of mandates after the First World War. And countries, in many countries in, in, in West Asia and North Africa, the Middle East, they got independence before India. Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, even before India. The Palestinians were promised, but never got it. But anyway, uh, you had the, uh, that historically. You then have, of course, this geopolitical importance in more recent decades. And then you have the resistance to the United States because of its foreign policy, which led to 9-11. And you now have this term, terrorism, which is associated with Islam. In fact, you have a very peculiar term. And that term is, which everybody uses, apart from terms like jihad, jihad, uh, Islamic terrorism. You all heard this term, Islamic terrorism. Have you heard of the term Christianic terrorism? Hinduistic terrorism, hmm? Buddhistic terrorism, huh? Sikhistic terrorism. Now there are Sikh terrorists, there are Muslim terrorists, there are Hindu terrorists, there are Christian terrorists, there are Buddhist terrorists, there are secular terrorists, huh? all kinds of terrorists. Huh? But when you say Islamic terrorism, what you're doing, of course, is connecting the religion to that. Hmm? And this is now part of the everyday discourse. And of course, since we think in language of God, this is what generates them. And of course, it's bullshit. It's not correct. Huh? You have all kinds. I mean, terrorism is something I've talked about uh, elsewhere. That's something you can take up if you like. But my point is that other countries benefit from this Islamophobia. What are those countries? Russia. It has problems with Chechnya. It has its, uh, wants to dominate. What's happening in the Central Asian republics is that you have dictatorships in which the opposition to the dictatorship in many cases is being led by Islamist forces. And of course, Russia comes with their support of these dictatorships. Yeah? Those Islamist forces have a positive aspect opposing it and a negative aspect in terms of the social program and so on. But Russia can see the advantage of that. The Chinese can see the advantage of that, Xinjiang. And the Indians can see the advantage of that, Kashmir. So you can see all that here. So that is an Islamophobia of the West. What about India? And what about Sun Parivar? The Sun Parivar Islamophobia is foundational. It comes from what it can be what I call the sleeping beauty concept of nationhood that the Sun Parivar has. The sleeping beauty concept of nationhood. Do you know the story of sleeping beauty? You don't know the story. Sleeping, some of you know. Sleeping Beauty was the beauty who was sleeping for long and then who was awakened by the kiss of Prince Charming. And there was an evil witch that put her to sleep and only then woke. So, what the Sangpariwar is saying is that the beauty of India was its essential Hinduness. Huh? But this was slumbering for decades. But now the piece of politics being given by the Sam Parivar is awakening it. But there was an evil witch that put this beauty of him to sleep. What was that? Was it the Mughals? Was it the Persians? Was it the Afghans? Was it the Turks? No. It was Muslims. Because when you say Muslims, you cover all of that. And you also add everything else that comes from the uh, and the south or this, that, everything here. It's a sleeping beauty council. Hmm? And it generates this here. Hmm? In actual fact, nationalism as a nation is not an ancient problem. Hmm? Even some who say that the nation is old recognize that nationalism is not old, it's modern because it's the nation of mass politics. Hmm? But the nation is not old, the nation is new, the nation is still there. There are two ways in which you can understand the nation. Hmm? You can either understand nationalism as belonging to the past. And unfortunately, even those forces which are against Hindutva can also uh, 
subscribe to this bullshit. Just more to stop here. Yeah. If you say that it belongs to the past, that it is an inheritance from the past, then there will always be disputes about what is the proper inheritance and who are the proper inheritors. You can see that in India. Proper inheritance is. No, 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 it's composite national. It's not this thing here. But it's composite because the great beauty of India throughout the ages is how tolerant it was. And so you had up and you had this and that. But if it was so ancient, then it comes even before uh, Islam. And, other, and then it comes even there, and then you have overlaps of various kinds. And so the poet is ancient. And this is the problem. The second way of understanding it is that nationalism and the nation belongs to the present and the future. It is what we will make of it. And do we want to make of it a more humane and decent nationalism or not? So be very careful about all this stuff that says, oh, it's in far here. But of course, so many, including non some people, also fall into this trap of trying to say, oh, it's something that was there here, to glorify. And that's also related. India was colonized. But we are related to them because of the spiritual character that we have in this time. Every bloody country has its positives and its negatives. Be more modest about it. About it. And be much more critical about the crap that exists in your own country, past and present. And that applies to the United States, and the Hong Kong, it applies to Russia, it applies to China, it applies to everywhere. Uh, be much more modest and committed to trying to reform this. Uh, don't just buy into this. Uh, oh, we are so great. Uh, uh, this appeal to national pride. Uh, 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 anyway, so that's it. Here's the thing. What is the distinctiveness of the sum? The sum is distinctive as compared to all other far right forces is four. Compared to all other far right forces everywhere. It's longevity. It has existed since 1925. Japan and North come much more recently. Bolsonaro, Duterte, others, much more recently. Was. Two, it's mass implantation. Three, it is the only political party in India that has never suffered a major split. Janta <laughs> became part of the Janta Party, came out, changed its name, no major split. One fourth, the weakness of the other opposition, including the Bush opposition. The Pen is there, but you have other stronger parties. You had Bolsonaro in Brazil, but now you have other parties that are strong. Meloni is there, but the other parties are there, so there, in fact, the other parties are much weaker. So that's it. And why is it that it has no major split? That's related to the crudity of its own uh, ideology. Because this ideology is so crude, and it's so easy to grasp and to believe it, and that's enough. We can make India strong. And all of our Indians should be strong, Hindus was you like. Samarka, Hinduize all politics and militarize Hinduism. One success. Left politics, I mean, if you are a left group of a small type, you have to have an understanding of this or that or that, what's happening internationally, what's happening here, yeah, yeah. and you'll have differences on that over here. But you have to have a programmatic perspective that is so wide and deep, uh, and let's say to be serious here. Yeah. I mean, to be a member of somebody, it's so simple, yeah. That one benefit over here, yeah. I'm getting power now, I'm going to knock you here. Simple. So I'm saying is that that's all the, but this of course is different. Let me now come to the last part is that how do we fight against it? Hmm? <coughs> Given that this is something which is global, but variations, the fight against it will be on the national terrain to begin with. If you can change or defeat it, those uh, forces or currents in those countries, then of course it's a game. And here of course that will have an impact globally. But it will be uneven. In the countries that are more powerful or important, if you can defeat it, the, uh, what, what's the fact? The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the spread effect <coughs> is much greater. Hmm? If you are able to uh, get rid of uh, right wing force in the United States, its global impact is much greater. If there's a fall of Saudi Arabia from dictatorship and this thing to something much more humane, it will have a big impact that whole region. Huh? 
Uh, if there's a change in Russia or China, then the authoritarianism that has a big impact. That would be much more important than if it happens in Sri Lanka or whatever, obviously. Uh, so something happened in Turkey, yeah. obviously. It's not only in a smaller country by size, but which is more powerful and important, uh, like in, uh, uh, in, in Sweden or somewhere like that. It can have a big impact. So that's one thing. Yeah. The, uh, 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 what about India? And I'll end here about India. Do we think that the existing far right with fascistic characteristics of, this, of the South is a longer term problem? If we agree that it is a longer term problem, then we have to look for longer term actors to fight. <coughs> and here you have five broad choices. One, whether we like it or not, we have to go along with one of the other uh, bourgeois parties. And then comes the question of the role of the Congress. And then there are two directions. Whether we like it or not, the Congress has to be the nucleus of this long-term story. The other version, which Yoginder Yadav used to have, that it's not the Congress. We have to build another force, but the Congress should contribute towards building that because of its history and experience. Now he shifted. It's come to this thing. That's uh, two uh, first Do you really think so? Huh? You really think that this which is neoliberal, which is there? Because one thing I hope it should be clear from here is that can you defeat these far-right forces without attacking the question of neoliberal capitalist development itself? In which case you can go in one of two directions. You can talk about trying to restore a much more, or establish a kind of much more social democratic, strongly welfare capitalism of the old time. Huh? Or you can have to think that we have to go beyond it. And to even think about going beyond it, one of the most powerful sources is the question of the ecological crisis, which we can discuss there, and its compatibility with the capitalism. But the relation, anyway, that's one. The second approach, India has got a whole range of progressive social movements. These should come together in some way. <coughs> the biggest effort to do this, and that's correct, they have progressed, has been the NAPF, National Alliance of People's Movement. But it is not so. Well, and there are reasons for that, in the sense that there are different silos on specific issues and demands generally. And even though it's a good thing that it has come together, they have not been able to express themselves intellectually or to actually develop a common program which could actually generate. A third is the caste question. The caste, that's a big flaw. What about here? What do we see here? In my view, what we saw is the caste question is related like the racist question and the gender question to questions of fundamental discrimination. And insofar as they're related to the question of discrimination, what happens is that the struggles against these discriminations seek equality and upward mobility. But equality within what framework? If you can get upward mobility within the existing framework through your struggles, that becomes a powerful attraction. And what you had, for example, in the United States, is a five-fold increase in the black middle class, which is all behind the Democratic Party. Have that here, yeah? And the majority of, uh, of, of uh, disproportionate number of prisoners in the United States remain black. The disproportionate number of people suffering from poverty you know, remain blacks, and so on. Hmm? In the case of India, on the question of feminism, <coughs> many women have moved out, something that we never, ex we never expected in the 60s because the oppression of women predates oppression of class. So we thought that if there is a movement towards greater equality between women and men, it will have a universal impact. What we have now is that at the class level, the differences in income and, uh, and wealth between men and women at upper, is much less than it was 30 years ago. But the gap between upper class women and lower class women is much greater. And you have any number of feminists, etc., who are quite happy with capitalism and justify American foreign policy in the name of feminism. We have to get uh, invade Afghanistan because of the country treating women or whatever. Cost. You see in the same way in India. 
not only is the sums being able to take, because you have a division even within the law, uh, even within the law, and, yeah. and you have an upward mobility to a certain extent in which they themselves can actually say, okay, that's fine. So there's no automatic transition towards trying to transform or rechange the whole nature of that society uh, uh, in the same way. It's very problem. In fact, uh, what did America, everybody talks about America, but in my view, America first talked about the independent labor party. And he talked about caste and class coming together. Hmm? He ended up in this sort of illusion that he said now the only way to get rid of caste is to become uh, a Buddhist. It was a form of escapism. And the irony is that even as everybody talks about <coughs> what is the proportion, change in the proportion of neo Buddhists between Ambedkar's time and today? It's hardly The question then, yeah, the fourth question, fourth answer, whether we like it or not, is the existing left parties, hmm? the mainstream parties or the other uh, far left parties. Huh? In my view, that's really the idea that the mainstream parties have shifted towards the right. They are still different from the other parties in quality to be better. But having trained themselves in a kind of Stalinism and whatever, it's the capacity to be able to generate the kind of ideological discipline, commitment and elsewhere is much greatly, greatly wrong. The fifth question is that you can't separate the question of fighting in the long term against the South from the question of building a newer kind of left is itself much more democratic in general, anti-Stalinist, non-Maoist, uh, understand the importance of, of, of democracy, doesn't look upon the Soviet Union or China as models or whatever, uh, but talks about a much deeper sense of democracy. And you can learn a lot from the whole left tradition uh, of the past. Uh, that is what the liberal democracy can generate or operate as you try to uh, move in that sense over here. It's like three concentric circles, if you like. Mm -hmm. Not uh, separated from each other, but overlapping. At the hub, a new left. Around it, the next circle of uh, progressive social movements of various kinds. And the third one of other non-BJP, uh, non some uh, uh, political forces and others. And they will be placed for all kinds of alliances, basically tactical. Tactical is trying to in this the time that you're talking about. Huh? But if you're talking about tactical, yes, there are so many things that you can come together to fight for this demand, to fight for this set of demands, and so on. But in the longer term, question of trying to actually generate the forces that will successfully fight against this uh, hegemony of the, uh, of, of the sun is a much longer term thing. And that, in my view, is absolutely central to that is the question of activism. The weak spots of the South, Taiwan and the far right in India are very clear. The weak spots are jobs, health, welfare, caste, democracy, and ecological policies. The key is activism, ideological discipline, training, of course, all that is there, education, but activism, involvement in these struggles, for which you need cadres a data-based development of activists. That's always been the absolutely crucial thing in order to be able to generate that. And that, I think, in the longer term, is not particularly comforting for activists to know this, but at least we should go the direction we have to head to. And one thing interesting, I believe, is that the relationship of forces between the capital and, and, and ordinary working people and, and, and working class is now so large, which is why they've been able to do that, uh, move in your liberty. Is that if you are able to fight to change that, you have to change a relationship forces which is much more in favor of our enemy than in favor of us. So successful advances in that struggle will in fact put the question of transcending capitalism onto the agenda in a way that didn't exist. And that's really what uh, we have to uh, try and, uh, and do. Um, there is no shortcut. We can have successes there and there. But in the longer term, I do believe that what we really have to do is to build a kind of uh, a force uh, to, uh, to that. And, and to learn the 
left has to also learn how to work together in different ways. Across its own way, which is also a language. And of course, the characters are the same. So I'll stop. <laughs>